Happy Monday. Today is August 9th. This is the 12th session doing the work part three of the PMP prep. I will be your facilitator, Will Garner, and Kathy O'Toole is going to be our backup facilitator. With that, let's go ahead and see if I can get some stuff off the screen and actually progress here. Let's start with uh, Kathy. I put a little thing together here. Maybe it will help. Um, but it, what it was was kind of the categories that you guys went over on, the, on just the last session last Wednesday, and then the enablers and some some graphics, some easy stuff here. If you wanted to take a second to chat about that, please. Sure. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Mm hmm All right. So, um, yeah, we covered three topics um, during last Wednesday session regarding managing communications and engaging stakeholders and creating project artifacts. So um, some of the things related to managing communications, we had talked about how we needed to um, make sure we understood the needs of all of our stakeholders um, from a communication perspective, and then that we should um, plan the uh, methods of communicating to our stakeholders and creating some sort of a matrix that will help us keep track of who needs what and when they need it. So um, we would not burden folks who needed um, very high level summaries like our senior management, and we could give um, the details to our project team. Um, we also talked about uh, the idea of feedback and making sure that our communication has been um, understood we talked a little bit about the default being that if somebody um, understands your communication, they probably will not respond to you um, after it's been sent. But if you're ever concerned that someone does not understand your communication, you really need to follow up with them, you know, either face to face or on a phone call to be sure that they've got it. Uh, then we talked about stakeholders. Um, and, and we talked about how to, how to categorize them and how to think about um, what categories we might have of stakeholders. And um, it's important to know um, what their engagement should be so that you're sure that you have the right parties involved in your project. You don't want to get down to the end of your project and find out you have a group of people that are impacted by it that you never even talked to throughout the whole life cycle. Um, so it's really good to do your homework and figure out who the, all your stakeholders are and make sure you have them engaged. And then we also talked about project artifacts and what might be necessary to produce um, given that either in a um, waterfall method of um, project management where you have requirements and solution documents and so forth. And the fact that your um, these documents are living documents and you'll be continuing to update them it's really helpful for people that go behind you and either pick up your project, maybe mid cycle, or um, if they refer to your project in a future time to make sure that your artifacts are um, in order and you've updated them with the most current information necessary um, for them to understand what happened during the project. Um, it's really, really helpful. And then, um, we also, you know, talked a little bit about, um, I think in the agile world, you would, your, one of your most important artifacts is your um, product backlog and knowing uh, what all are priorities for the customer and um, your stakeholders and making sure that you have that um, product backlog um, always, you know, that being a living document and keeping it uh, updated as much as possible. So with that, um, does anybody have any questions about any of the stuff that we reviewed last week, or are you guys good to move forward? I think we're good, Will. Yeah, nice summary, Kat, that was awesome. Hey, did, did they still show this graphic that I put down here at the bottom? This is one of the most impact, did they still, did they still show this in the material, this formula for mm -hmm. the amount of number of communication channels? No. Oh, it gosh. wasn't in the material that I, I reviewed. Oh my gosh, I'll tell you what, this is something that shows how impactful, and this is a really simple chart. So what, what, what this, this formula does 
is it really kind of helps you gauge kind of the impact of how, how important a communication plan is and everything that you guys talked about with Kathy last week. And these boxes would each represent a person and the person can, rep can talk to any one of the other three people, right? So each of the lines, one, two, three, four, five, six lines would be communication channels. So four people, you have four possible communication channels. So to understand the impact of it, look at how big some of our projects are. 20, 30 people, hell, who knows how many people. Do this formula for that and you can understand really how important a communication plan is. That's kind of the big takeaway that I always had with this years ago when I started, when this was in the pen box. I'm not sure, maybe it's still in there now, but something that I always appreciated about, uh, you know, the value of it. Ah, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Someone mentioned that it is uh, it is in the pinbox. So good, good, good. So again, thank you, Kathy, for going over that, guys. I hope it's helpful um, that we do that. Um, kind of get your minds reset on something that was familiar before we go learn something that might be new to you. Um, so this is doing the work part three, the third part of what you guys are talking about. So today we'll talk about managing project changes managing project issues and ensuring the knowledge transfer to project continuity. Here's my value add to you guys like I did the last time, right? And we made a deal, right? I'll tell you how many slides are in this if you let me know that you're gonna engage. It worked out great last time. I'm asking you to please do that again, right? So this session has 39 slides. We have time to get engaged. The content that we're gonna cover is from chapters four and 11 in the PMBOK, okay? I have each of the business processes with the page numbers. If you guys wanted to go reference the PMBOK material for what we're talking about today, okay? All right. So lesson objectives by topic. So we're gonna manage uh, project changes. We'll detect issues with optimal action to achieve project successes and um, we'll confirm the approach for knowledge transfers. So let's get into managing project changes. Um, I hope everyone on the call is at least familiar with change. Whether you like it or not is completely subjective. There are people that I've read when I was going in, in schools, adaptive leadership was a topic that we talked about. And it was really interesting because folks were saying that really it's not change that people fear. It's it's losing something or it's, it, it, it's, it's a loss that people change. And, and there's another thing that stated that, you know, a lot of the successes and the most successful people, most successful company have a capacity to adapt and overcome change and bring people with them in a way that not only just kind of gets over it, but they thrive through it. So it's really interesting and important to talk about pro, uh, managing project change. And I added this talent triangle thing in here because it's important that we take a look at the context of what we're talking about, right? Project management isn't so much schedules and, and budget anymore. There, there's leadership, there's strategic and business management, and then there's also technical project management. So our leaders are expecting more of us than they did 10, 20 years ago as project managers. That's not just a technical job anymore. So that's why a lot of these topics are coming up. The, our management, our leaders are expecting us to be able to work through these things. So, a great project manager is an effective manager of change, able to anticipate, respond to, and deal with changes that will inevitably arise on any project, okay? It's inevitable, it's gonna happen. You just gotta be able to work through it. Uh, it's just part of, part of the job, part of what we do, and part of actually keeps our blood flowing. Um, projects can get boring when um, we didn't have the changes to work through. So we look at enablers. Where am I here? Um, some of the enablers that we have is we need to uh, anticipate and embrace the need for change. Those are important, anticipating, being ready for it and embracing it, a accepting that it's just part of what we do. It's part of the DNA of a project manager. Determine strategy to handle change, execute change management strategies according to the methodology, and then determine a change response to move the project forward. Um, when we take a look at our deliverables and tools, so deliverables, issue logs, risk registers, stakeholder registers, and then updated issue logs. Um, we're gonna do that through um, managing and updating those logs, project management information systems, PMIS, um, communicating with stakeholders and negotiating with stakeholders. So what is a change management plan? 
So most projects undergo one or more changes during their lifetime. New or change requirements can impact the project's scope, schedule, cost, risk, quality. Um, during project execution, monitoring can also dictate the need for a change in any of these areas. So a change management plan is a component of the, of the project management plan um, that establishes the change control board and documents the extent of its authority and describes how the change control system will be implemented. So some of the things when we look at it in context, I think remember when we look at these slides, they try to, they try to help us understand these concepts. Um, so, so what does a change management, change management plan do? Well, it helps us answer who can propose a change, what exactly constitutes a change, what is the impact of the change on the project's objectives? What steps are necessary to evaluate the change request before approving or rejecting it? When a change request is approved, what project documents must be amended to record the actions necessary to affect the change? And how will these actions be monitored to confirm that they have completed, they have been completed satisfactorily? So, is there anyone on the call right now that has a, I say this and I don't mean it to be weird if you don't have it, but a formal change control process on the projects that they're working? And does it align with what you would see here? Anybody hey, can William, speak to this? Hey, um, I don't. I don't know if I necessarily have a question for that, but I want to make sure I'm understanding, I guess, the concept here um, before I could answer mm -hmm. that next question. So, and I feel like I should probably know this, but when you say change management plan, that that is not one of the management plans under the project management plan, correct? It's, it's just the whole change process. It's just the general term. We're not talking about the, like, like the resource management plan, right? That's a piece of the overall project management plan. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? The question I'm asking. It, it is. I'm actually, as you say that, I want to. I speak exact as I can, and I'm looking at uh, an excerpt from the PMBOK that says the change management plan is a sub plan created when the project management plan is created, and in its definition of change, uh, also the. So yes, yeah, so it is a sub plan of the project manager plan. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, I just didn't see it in the appendix of the Andy um, study guide, but that's fine. I'll okay. look. I'll look into it more. Thank you. Sure. No. So Penbox, look in the Penbox pages one thirteen to one twenty, and I think it might help you out. Okay. Perfect. I will sure, do that. One thirteen sure. to one twenty. So, so, by the way, thank you for speaking up. I appreciate that question. Um, it, in the projects that we that I have, the network cloud, um, network infrastructure projects, and the network cloud space for the company, you know, we have a formal process of, of, of when we have to add a new project and we have to add additional scope. There are reviews that happen and approvals that happen. Depending upon the, the severity of what needs to happen, that if it's a local change, not a big deal, right? It's something that we can take care of locally, not a big impact, easy owner. We'll just kind of do that through a CR, change request process, which is just through one of our databases. You know, we'll go through and we'll say, hey, well, here's an additional scope. This person has agreed to do it. Here's the impact of the overall schedule, not a big deal. But if it's something big that requires additional funding, requires additional resources, something pretty major, we have a formal process that we go through. Um, it goes through, it gets reviewed by level three plus leaders. They all agree and then we all get the, you know, our budget allocated. So there is a formal process, a formal change control board that is part of us um, changing and really receiving new projects as well. So it, it's in the company and I know that there's probably 10, at least 10, maybe 20s of different ways that some of these change control boards um, uh, setups work through some of our work groups. Anyone have any other ex any other uh, uh, conversations for for the topic? All right, well, let's keep going then. Um, 
So causes of project changes. I'm going to ask for some engagement here. You guys owe me now. I asked you, you didn't do anything last time. Victoria did, and thank you. So I want more. So causes of project changes. So inaccurate initial estimates. Someone give me an act, a, a reason why this might come up in your projects. Anybody, I don't care who. Come on. Because they don't understand what's involved. Ooh, good one. That's Could be a one. first time project or a first time with no history. Perfect, sure. Patrick, that's a great one. Uh, I'm guilty of missing requirements. Woof, you don't want to do that. Perfect, Steve. Thank you. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Do you think it's good or bad that we have these changes? Um, I think doesn't that depend on the project, really? Like, like I, my understanding is agile, right? It's sort of a welcome mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. but in waterfall, it's really we'll say looked down upon. I mean, you do make changes in waterfall, but it's mm -hmm. it's not as welcome, which has honestly been my general experience here at AT and T, to be honest. So, yeah. Well, everyone remember the concept of progressive elaboration. There's sometimes two, there are two great um, two great examples that were given just within the last 10 seconds that you just don't know what you don't know until you get there, right? And very agile thinking, but even in predictive, you know, you just don't know what you don't know yet. You know, things happen and things change and regardless of what you try to do, right? Those things come up. So some of the examples that they give us all in the paper in my, in my little guide would be, you know, lack of experience which someone had mentioned, lack of information, um, excessive optimism, I have been guilty of that one, especially with a project that I do know, Except excessive optimism was something that got me. Um, technological difficulties and then re unreliable resources. So what about, what about spec changes? So uh, project work can open up new, new avenues of development and design that weren't considered during municipal planning, right? It's just things, things adapt, things change get new spec or you have different requirement, maybe. Those things happen as well. Um, new regulations, right? That's another one. Um, you know, gov new governmental or industry specific regulations that may be enacted that we have to adapt to. I think that's something that we'll need to be able to, you know, have access and be resourceful and be able to anticipate it as much as you can, but I would imagine that folks that are engaged in these kinds of projects are, are aware of, of the regulations that are at play in their, in their space. Accommodating new regulations or legislation, um, you have to revisit the planning process, look at resource needs and scheduling. How about missed requirements? Um, requirements are understood by reviewing the documentation and interviewing the end users and policy makers, however, there are times when complete and comprehensive understanding may not be possible. I guess this kind of speaks to speaks to some of the benefits. I'll, I'll admit, I admitted to you guys before, I'm not the strongest on the agile side. I'm a very predictive, that's where my strengths are right now. I haven't had, although my thinking, my mindset, I think agile, but I, I feel like some of these things that maybe overcoming but some of these things, maybe not the new regulations, but some of these is really what drove us to agile methodology. Anyone want to challenge that or support that? I would support it because I feel that there are a lot of people who, um, you know, they thought they knew what they wanted and then it takes so long for them to get what they want and their business changes um, rather quickly. And mm -hmm. so by the time it got delivered to them, it was either um, not helpful or what mm -hmm. was delivered was um, according to a requirement that was given two years ago. And mm -hmm. so now um, it's outdated. Uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. And I think, you know, we look at project management as a profession um, instead of, I don't know what else to call it. The other example would be, you think about it as a, as a profession, you begin to look at project management through, through a, a model of concepts 
And, and one of those things might be how our skills are in being able to anticipate when things are starting to feel a little weird. Maybe we need to start looking at this. So, you know, it's up, instead of waiting for it to happen, how good are we at anticipating, being proactive and trying to identify those things before it actually has an impact on the project? I think it's pretty, pretty cool to think about things that way. So let's look at change control systems, okay? Um, change control system, a set of procedures that describes how modifications to the project deliverables and documentation are managed and controlled. An uh, effective change control system includes forms, tracking methods, processes, and approval levels required for authorizing or rejecting requested changes. Change control systems often specify that a CCB, a change control board, I will address the issues that affect cost, time, and product quality. That's what I was mentioning, right? I think there's some stuff that our group just has, like, you know, it's, it was an e it's something easy. It's not a big deal. It's easily absorbed into the project. Not a big deal. I'm not at a day. I may add hours, but it is an additional requirement. And, and I think the bigger part of where we're at today, our culture and my projects, is they just want to make sure that they're getting the credit for the work. So we just want to document that they did take on this additional thing. Um, it added a day, and uh, you know I, I don't know. It's just we talked last time we all got together. We talked about how do we recognize people and how do we do. Folks that step up to do that work it deserves recognition to me, a high five, or it deserves something, and that's their way of saying, hey, we did this, and that's our way of also recognizing that we appreciate. You know, it could have been a long drawn out process, and it didn't have to be though. Thank you for stepping up and, and, and taking that. Um, so uh, the change control strategy, so change management is the process of managing project changes in a structured and standardized manner. And there's five stages to this. Change identification involves identifying the changes that must be made to a project. The changes made positively, or negatively impact the planned project deliverables and performance. The requirement for change can be identified by anyone involved in the project. Stage number two is change documentation. It involves documenting the changes in the change control form, initiating a formal request for the change. And we analyze the impact of the change, which involves identifying and assessing the issues that may arise and adversely impact the various aspects of the project. This will usually be done by the project manager or any other requester. Fourth stage is take the course of action. It involves coordinating with the appropriate stakeholders to select the necessary actions to be taken and implementing the approved changes. And then finally, we update the related plans. It involves updating the project management plan components related to the approved change requests. So let's take a look at the change management process flowchart. Is there anyone on the call? This is another opportunity. Anyone on the call that has just a horrible time understanding process flowcharts? Oh, come on, don't be shy. If you are, then that's okay. All right, so change request form, right? We submit the change request form. We go to the change initiators and the PM logs the change request. Um, so there's some filters we talked about, right? In that next phase, um, analyzing the impact, changing documentation. So we fill out the form and then it goes to a review that looks for, is it is it passing so any filters that we have identified through the change management plan or not? Is there a deliverable affected, yes or no? I mean, where are we at with this thing? Where does it need to go? Um, if we kind of go through here, right? The triangles are decision points, right? You either reject it, you send a rejection notice, um, or you accept it and you go to the next thing, right? You do, is there a deliverable affected? Nope, there's not a deliverable affected, so you reject it, there's no change. If there is, then the PM looks to prepare the impact statement for a change request. Uh, and then there's a sequence of activities that will happen within this process where there's a minor impact PM reviews, moderate impact PM and stakeholder reviews, major impact PM, sponsor, and stakeholder reviews. So like I talked about with my projects, right, if it's a minor impact, I can make that decision. We can negotiate that, right? If it's moderate, then you start adding 
a little bit more folks, right? If it's major, we, I think we may even go up to, uh, to level four sometimes, AVP level for some of our approvals if it's a significant change. Um, it gets reviewed and is, if it's authorized, we continue, we build it, we execute it, we balance it, replan, you know, update the related plans. If it's not authorized, then the answer is no, no change. Continue as you were. Are there any, uh, any, any questions related to this? Does everyone understand maybe the impact and how, how your plan would have di different levels of, how it may have different levels of change may determine who makes the decisions, right? So approved change requests uh, or requests that have been reviewed and approved in accordance with the integrated change control plan and are ready to be scheduled for implementation. These changes can affect cost, scope, quality, schedule, procedures, plans, or policies. Approved changes can include uh, corrective action, which are which adjusts the performance of the project, um, project work with the project management team. Uh, preventative action ensures future performance of the work project work with the project management plan. Defect repair, which modifies a non-conformance within the project, and updates, which modifies project documents and plans to reflect the project changes. Guidelines to manage project changes. All right, so uh, managing changes to project performance baseline ensures that the original project scope and the integrity of performance baselines are maintained, ensuring that changes are agreed upon and continuously managing changes as they occur minimizes the impact changes may have on project time and scope. The, the, the big takeaway of that statement there is that it's going to happen. We just have to understand, be, be comfortable being uncomfortable and work through it. Work through it with your team, um, follow the plan, you follow the proper documentation and you know, just work through it. Um, to effectively perform integrated change control, follow these guidelines. Uh, so make sure your change control system is cost effective. It should not cost more money to implement than it saves through controlling. Interesting statement there, huh? Uh, establish or make use of an existing CCB compo change control board, compose the project stakeholders to evaluate change requests. So we're looking at what is the magnitude of change when compared to the plan? What is the impact of the change on the project schedule cost and quality objectives? What are the potential risks and benefits of the change? Document the effect the changes have on the applicable project baselines. Obtain approval from the appropriate parties for all change requests before implementing change. Use configuration management to document and control changes to the original product characteristics. Coordinate changes across knowledge areas as appropriate. So for example, does a proposed schedule change, affect cost, risk, quality, staffing, anything else? Use performance reports to measure performance uh, and assess whether planned variances require corrective action. Make sure performance reports are timely and accurate to increase the effectiveness of control decisions. Identify corrective action necessary to bring expected performance in line with the project plan. So you determine the source and the severity of the problem. Review the project plan and the objectives. Consider factors inside and outside the project that may influence corrective action decisions. Identify alternative options that are available and choose from among the alternatives by evaluating the impact of each on cost, schedule, quality, and risk. Update your project plan to reflect the changes and that may affect the performance baselines and then document lessons learned, including the cause uh, the project baselines that are affected, the rationale behind recommending the change, and then any other lessons learned through the change control. So this is the end of 
the first on managing project changes. What questions do we get? What other discussion topics? What other experiences do you have that you, good or bad, that has to do with either change control process, change control board, um, change, you know, big changes, little changes, you know, let's, let's hear some examples. Here's some stories. Nobody has changes on their projects. I guess that's what I'm hearing. Hey, I think Does you anybody have a project? <laughs> Good. I was, this is Kathy. I was just asking, does anyone have a project right now they're working on? Oh, good point. <laughs> I didn't even ask that. <laughs> yeah, this, just this to, is... I actually do have one that I was working on for um, most of the world where uh, I think it was a misrequirement because they didn't ask me. So I wanted for them to, to, make, to make a change um, mm -hmm. given that I didn't get the opportunity to provide my requirements. And, you know, it got, it got a little bit heated because they didn't want to go back to the vendor and ask for a change. Mm. So. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I got what I wanted. So that was good. <laughs> well, that would be a good lesson learned, right? For, were you the project lead on that or were you? Uh, no, I was one of the stakeholders. So I represent okay. the care organization. So usually uh. the, I don't get engaged until later on. But sometimes later on, it's just a little bit too late, given that sometimes we have requirements that need, you know, either development or agreement from from the partner. So um, that was one of those next time ask me earlier. Great. Well, and that's provide. great input from a different perspective, Justice. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Frank or Patrick, someone else had, had something as well. Yeah, this is Patrick. Uh, I've I've been on projects where we've had uh, very stringent uh, change control processes and governance board reviews and and uh, things of that nature. Then I had other projects that I were, I were and those usually are, are tight, you know, tight projects. And you know, you know what's going on with them and what's happening. I've been on other projects that had a very loose change control process, or really not even uh, that. You know, I don't even know if you want to call it a change control process, but uh, they would just, uh, you know, update project plans and, and timelines would slip and it was just a little, you know, it's, if you don't have a, a good uh, change control process, the project yeah. could get a little sloppy and uh, cost you some time and, and some re resources, resource time and dollars. Got it. Yeah, good example. Anyone else, anyone else from an agile perspective, maybe remember, listen, I'm not scared to admit my weaknesses, but from an agile perspective, how does change control work? How about some of those examples, good or bad? Or is it just part of agile is frequent, you know, at the end of each, each at the end of each phase, you do your reviews and before you go to the next one, right? You approve the last one and I discuss changes. I mean, how, how does that work? What's everyone's experience? Kathy, so I have a natural project right now um, with IBM development and they um, maintain that if there's a problem with something and in my case, it was that they didn't do their homework on the assumptions, and they assumed that if they were going to convert a group of billing systems into their universal biller platform, that all of the relevant tax taxability decisions were in our already embedded in our um, tax engine that supports the biller. But that wasn't mm -hmm. true, and so then that caused a little bit of a um, gotcha for them. But it wasn't a, a formal change that got implemented. M more so it was, oh, now we have to um, replan our program increment. So mm -hmm. they discovered this in their first program increment, so then they stopped 
uh, working on it until they had more information and they re um, they pushed out the work into another program increment later in the year and then that way they could absorb the work that needed to be done and um, plan it properly according to um, the agile guidelines that they're following. Okay. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else have a contribution, please, before we head to the next the next topic here? I'm assuming that if you have not been a part of change of a change, you've probably been a, probably been a part of a project issue. I'm going to make that assumption. So I'm encouraged for additional participation in this topic. Projects do not always go smoothly. Anyone want to challenge that? Nope. <laughs> and situations can arise which have the potential to affect the scope, schedule, or costs if left unattended. These situations are called issues, and this topic addresses how to handle them. So, enablers, we're going to recognize when a risk becomes an issue, there's a reason why they're different, attack the issue with the optimal action to achieve project success, and then collaborate with relevant, with relevant stakeholders on the approach to resolve the issues. No deliverables or tools, let's work through what we do here. So, an issue is defined as a current condition or situation that may have an impact on project objectives. In other words, it is an action item that the project team must address. Issues can arise in many project management processes, often in monitoring and controlling, most often in monitoring and controlling. Common areas include uh, scope, schedule, cost, project variance analysis, quality risk, procurement, and communications. Risks and issues. In the discussion of risks, there's a big difference between risks and issues. A risk is generally defined as an event that might impact a project, whereas an issue is a risk that has happened and will impact the project. Anyone? Did I lose anyone with that? A risk may or may not impact the project. An issue is a risk that has been realized. It is, it has impact, it must be addressed. Clear? So risks focus on the future, can be positive or negative. That's an important point as well. Um, is documented in the risk register and response is called risk response. A, an issue is focused on the present, will always be negative, is documented in the issue log and response is called a workaround. So here they have give us a couple, give me a couple examples. Here are a few examples of risks that have become issues. Risk, the risk was that a project manager, manager might leave the project. So you understand that it's possible, you know, your plan there would be your, uh, your risk response. The issue, the risk is realized when the project manager resigns. Another one, risk was a supplier might go on strike. Well, what would the issue be? If the risk is a supplier that might go on strike, someone tell me what the issue would be. You wouldn't have the anybody to do is, the work. Well, the issue would be that the supplier does go on strike. An yeah. issue is a risk that has been realized. So perfect, you're right, absolutely right. So here's another one, right? A risk, a snowstorm might close the plant and delay the project. So what would the issue be? The risk was a snowstorm might. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the, the issue is that it does close the site and stop the work. That's right. So, yeah. yeah, a major a major snowstorm closes the plant. That it's literally a risk is a it's possibility. It's a future view. It issue a risk becomes an issue once it's been realized. It happens. Right. The risk is my kids are going to hurt themselves if they don't wear their helmet and knee pads when they're riding their bike. Well, the issue would be, you know, they hurt themselves because they didn't because they wrecked their bike and they didn't have their helmet and knee pads on. My kids are too old for that, but still, same thing. So the goal of risk assessment is to list every risk that a project might face and then to develop responses to each risk. However, in the real world, this is not possible. And unforeseen events happen that take the project from all as well as we have a big problem. Here's a great example. I'm going to use it, and it's in, it's still project management, but I got into the industry, I don't know, 20 something years ago now, and I was a tower climber. I was climbing towers for um, companies like AT&T and Singular and um, Sprint and Nextel and all these companies putting the antennas up that way our mobile phones work. Um, before we would actually have our day, we would have a job safety report. So before we would actually do our day's work, we would say, here's what we're going to do today. Here's the risks that are associated with that particular job, right? You can cut yourself. You can, you, you can bang your shin on something. You can, well, you can fall off the tower if you're down 100% tie off. You know, all those things kind of happen. And that's, that's a really practical way for me to think about this as well, right? We're anticipating, you know, what, what might happen. And sometimes just in, in the process of going through that activity, someone in the group, because we're all talking about this together, it isn't me sitting in a corner and then you sit in a corner and you do your job safety report, you do yours and you do yours over there. We're all talking about this for 10 minutes before we start. And we're thinking, you know what else could happen? Those are the types of things that we say, oh, that's, that's another great one. And that's where the, you know, the diversity of a group and having different people a part of your project and having the opportunity for people to have a voice, um, you might be able, you're going to do a better job um, with your team going through these exercises than you're going to be able to have by yourself. Right? Does that make any sense? Any, anything else to add to that? Anyone want to agree or disagree with me? Example? And team building exercises, I don't know what it was. I think it was my, six, my black belt, Six Sigma thing, whatever. Um, um, the, um, one of the exercises was, okay, guys, so here's how you do uh, the exercise. Everybody list, everybody list um, as many candy bars as you possibly can, right? So you go down and you list all the candy bars that you know of, everything you can think of. And you might have three or four at the, at the, you know, at the point of pressure, you're like, oh, crap, that's all I can remember. But the whole class of 20, while you had three or four, we ended up with like 30 because everybody contributed. And I think that's just a testament to us being able to put all of our heads, put our heads together and, you know, go through um, risk analysis, right? Does that make sense? I don't know what's going on here. I think annotate. Okay, so issue log. The issue log is a document where information about issues is recorded and monitored. It is used to track problems and consistencies or conflicts that occur during the life of the project and require investigation in order to work toward a resolution. Remember, an issue is a risk that has been realized. It has to be addressed. Um, typical issue log, right? So ID, whatever, description, what happened, when did it open, due date, represents the date by which the issue should be resolved and your goal is to close every issue what's the priority who's the owner um, an issue should be assigned to only one owner who will act as the focal point for resolving it in this case think of the issue owner as a sim as you know similar to a work package owner um, an issue log is not a to-do list if in doubt about whether something belongs in the issue log revisit the definition of an issue and confirm if it applies to the situation or not so issue resolution, um, when an issue occurs, it should be promptly added to the issue log, right? And again, guys, I mean, these things that they give us, 
there's probably a million templates out there, right? Find one that works for you and you can use in your projects. And, you know, like we talked about the last time, it gets added to your lessons learned log and we'll talk about that later. But this is stuff that you'll be able to track and reference at some point later in time. Um, Nothing. Each issue should have an owner who is responsible uh, for tracking the progress of the workaround and reporting back to the project manager. Uh, the due date should be realistic and every reasonable attempt should be made to meet it. Um, issues should be a regular topic of every status meeting with the goal to keep the number of open issues to a manageable number. Um, excuse me. Don't hesitate to escalate an issue to the project sponsor if it begins to have a major effect on the project. So guidelines to resolving the issues. To resolve issues, follow these guidelines. Use your organization's issue log template or create one, whatever works for you, if there's no templates available. Train the project team members to promptly report potential issues to the project manager, who will determine if they need to, if they belong in the log. Enter the issue, monitor the progress, or enter the issue and assign the owner to due date. Monitor the progress, make sure it gets done, review it on, pro, on the project status meetings. Um, develop a response to the issue, assess impact, approve, and then close the issue once it's resolved. All right, there's another topic done. We are cruising. What contribution does anyone have to project issues? Risks versus issues. Anyone not understand the concept of that, please? There's no shame. I just want to make sure that everyone goes away understanding some key concepts, please. I think you explained it really well, William. Thank you. Hey, now that kind of contribution is always appreciated. So just so you know, uh, but is there anything else, uh, any other, anything else that anyone had to add to the topic, please? This is normally the time, right? We're at that almost we're an hour in, an hour to go. We have about 13 slides left. I hear people leaving or coming, one of the two. Um, do we want to push on or yeah. do we want to take a quick break? I have a vote for pushing on, multiple votes for pushing on. Let's go. Yes, all Let's right, I love it. it. Hey, I love it. I love the enthusiasm. Thank you for that one. All right. What is the next? So ensure knowledge transfer for project continuity. We're going to continue. You ask for it, it's going to happen. So let me get. They didn't have any really good questions for me on this one, guys. I, I'm sorry about that. I, I know we had some fun with them last time, but in the templates that I got for this series, I didn't have, they were like situational scenario kind of things. And I don't know, those get kind of weird sometimes, but you know, um, I like the multiple choice type of questions for these. It just gets everyone thinking, gets everyone engaged. It's not overly interactive where it's uncomfortable, but it's here's your answers and let's select. I, it, I just didn't have those for this. So my apologies for not having those. I'm sure you guys will have plenty of questions on your own anyway. So last topic of the evening Oops. is to ensure. Now, go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. I was going to ask whether that was a risk or an issue. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a risk, but the, the issue would have to do with what, what the what the effect would be. So if because we didn't have a couple questions in these reviews that you guys are going to have problems retaining the information, well, then the issue is you're going to say, hey, well, I didn't understand a dang thing you talked about because you didn't have questions. And then Barry's going to call or, or uh, Brian's going to call me and say, we you need to have questions, but you need to have questions for this because you've got an issue now. So is that the perfect application or what? So <laughs> yep. I agree. <laughs> see? <laughs> Whatever. We'll see though. We'll see though. All right.
sell here is, you know, the workaround or the risk, what do they, what do they call the risk, risk response is to go do some practice questions on your own, mitigate the issue. How's that? The delegation. All right. Ensure knowledge transfer for project continuity. It is important for project team members to obtain the right knowledge at the time when they need it to do their job. Therefore, as the project manager, you need to know how to collect, consume, and use the knowledge so that the team is prepared and ready. You should also know how to transfer this knowledge to other projects so they can benefit from it. Remember when we talked about this? Great. Uh, Kathy, I'm not sure if you were on that call or not. It was uh, two weeks, maybe at least two weeks ago. Um, what we talked about is everyone, in every, even Pete Pembach and everything else, talks about lessons learned and, you know, lessons learned the registers and how to, what, there's a lot of different systems and, and tools that we have to track lessons learned. But how often is there a database that's searchable for particular topics? You can search your lessons learned for common things that have happened. And we've had great dialogue about, you know what? I don't, it's interesting, it's interesting to think about that. I don't, I'm not going to go through, you know, Kathy, the last, um, um, I don't know what the real answer, but the last 15 years of projects you've worked to say, well, well, what has Kathy come up with? No, I wanna know, like, I got this thing coming up. What has happened in Kathy's projects that she's tracked that might apply to me? So I wanna search, I don't know, resource constraints, or I wanna search, I don't know, design requirements or specs, or I wanna search that through the entire lessons learned database, and I wanna have all the hits come back to me and, and now be able to get some information out of that. Has anyone pursued that? Has anyone looked into that a little bit more since the last time we talked? All right, well, I haven't. Interesting, that's interesting though. Okay, so um, enablers, right? Maintaining the team and knowledge transfer, discussing the project responsibilities within the team, outline expectations for working environment, confirm approach for knowledge transfer. Types of knowledge. Uh, knowledge can be divided into two main types, explicit and tacit. Explicit knowledge is knowledge that can be codified using symbols such as words, numbers, and pictures. Tacit knowledge is personal knowledge that can be difficult to articulate and share such as beliefs, experience, and insights. As a project manager, you were concerned with managing both types of knowledge to take advantage of the knowledge, skills, and experiences that your project team members have gained throughout the project. Although collecting and gathering explicit knowledge is relatively easy to do, there is the risk of capturing only the facts and not the context surrounding the facts. Knowledge management is more than keeping track of what is known and then distributing it to the team. It's, it's while some of the knowledge management deals with the lessons learned, it is broader and more encompassing than just that portion of the project. For managing tacit knowledge, the keys to create and maintain trust among those involved in the project so they're willing to share experiences with everyone else. By obtaining those personal experiences of the project, the team is more fully understand, is able to more fully understand and leverage the knowledge. So knowledge management of project exists on three levels. Individual, I know, let's go back to that for a second. Is there anyone that wants to contribute to this, please? Explicit stuff is that can be used, words, numbers, it can be measured, right? Tacit stuff is just, it's more difficult to articulate. It's beliefs, experience, insights. Like, anyone want to speak to this? Anyone want to a, a new jump out project. and tell me? Go ahead, please. Yeah. I was going to say a new project manager may not have the experience 
that say, uh, you know, somebody who's been doing a certain project for any length of time knows kind of how to estimate what to do, where a new one mm -hmm. may not may not have that inherent knowledge or that learned mm -hmm. knowledge, so they will have to start kind of like from scratch. Great example. I love it. That's great. Or I'd like, to even add, mm -hmm. I'd like to even add that those that are particular SMEs and you know, particular areas have that expertise and expert knowledge on that area, while others may not and may not always be able to articulate that experience that they that they know. <laughs> but that's great. That's a perfect example. Any anything else, please? Those are two great examples. It's the stuff that you can't quantify, right? I mean, it's qualified. Well, this guy knows what the heck he's talking about, but you know, are there any other examples of that? Anyone I'll think one of these is more valuable than the other? Maybe. I mean, it's a few. Would would soft skills kind of fall into that? Like how to navigate certain, you know, how to work with certain people, how to engage certain industries or partners, just you know, things of that nature. I don't know if soft skills kind of fall into this, but how to actually interact with someone. You wouldn't explicitly maybe call those things out, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe certain stakeholders and dealing with them in a particular way might be tacit knowledge. I think I would agree with you, Steve. Okay. I, yeah. I think that is a really, so, really great example. Does anyone yeah. want to challenge that, please? I think it's a great example. Um, it's hard to measure that stuff. Right. Um, you know, but... Yeah. Yeah, you, you don't really engage an officer of the company the same way you might someone on the front line, but you both maybe sure. you need buy in on for both of them to make the project successful kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think cultural considerations um, would, would be around the same lines there, Steve. You know, like, you know, each team has their culture and has their way of doing things. And, and it's not like it's right or wrong. It's just you got to engage them a certain way. You got to engage with them a, a certain way. I've had people that you got to get real technical with them. Otherwise, they're just not interested in talking to me. And that's a problem for me. That's a gap for me. So, yeah, that's a yeah, great example, Steve. What else you got? Anything else, guys? These are those conceptual things, guys, that I keep talking about. It's, it's more than just black and white for project management. Those things are over. There is no thing of what they, to be a successful project manager and, and really – the mindset going into the exam is understanding concepts. There's things that may not ask about explicit or tacit knowledge, but you being able to understand influence versus equalified, you know, quantified versus qualified, and things may help you think about a response a certain way. So that's, that's all I'm trying to do here. There is no right or wrong answer. There really isn't, not in this, not in our discussion. Um, it's more just engagement. So I appreciate you guys getting involved. All right, so let's get back to where we were. I just wanted to touch base on that again. So thanks. Thanks for letting me do that. Um, so knowledge management of projects exists on three levels, individual, project, and organization. The individual level, each team member needs to know how to perform their work in accordance with the assigned tech, uh, a task scope, schedule, and cost, all while maintaining an acceptable level of quality. If a person does not possess the required knowledge for a task, they must acquire it through re excuse me, research um, on the uh, researching the topic to learn what they don't know and what they do know, collaborating with other team members to fill the gap, the knowledge gap, or they examine the project's knowledge repository. I think we, we all need to get together and create this way better system for um, queuing up um, keywords and knowledge repository systems here. So at the project level, the focus is on achieving the goals of the current project. The project manager will solicit knowledge from project managers or leaders involved with other projects. Uh, their experience can be applied to the current project. The PMO is also an excellent source of knowledge as it exists for the purpose of defining and maintaining standards for project management within an organization. <clears throat> the organizational level of knowledge is about managing programs or portfolios. The program manager, portfolio manager can seek information from peers who manage other programs and portfolios in an effort to adapt this knowledge to this specific need. So let's take a look at lessons learned. 
Knowledge gained during a project can be useful to subsequent phases of a project and to other projects. This knowledge is referred to as lessons learned. It can take the form of both positive and negative experiences that occur throughout the project life cycle. Remember, one of the positive ones that we talked about a couple weeks ago was just kind of how things, how the culture of a project is when you actually recognize people doing a great job. But give them a, again, give them a high five, give them a kudos, send them a card, or, you know, recognize their effort when they go above and beyond. You know, I think that stuff pays dividends into the success of a project. Somehow, maybe beyond what we're capable of realizing, but, you know, that stuff feeds in. Um, reinventing the wheel is both time consuming and costly and the amount of time and effort used to document what went well and what did not happen as planned can pay big dividends long into the future. So considerations of lessons learned, scheduling lessons learned. So here's some examples of some things they asked me to talk about scheduling lessons learned. These include any relevant scheduling problems or issues. They also document the management strategies implemented to deal with these changes or resource constraints. They capture beneficial approaches to implement as new best practice. So again, good and the bad. Conflict management lessons learned. These include any issues that arise within the team or between the team and customers. Um, they document the nature and the source of the conflict and the impact it had on the project but also specify how management intervened in response to the conflict. Vendor lessons learned. This is one that Kathy talked about earlier. It would have been documented. New seller experience or performance should be documented and provided to the procurement department. Customer lessons learned. The customer is excessively litigious or unreasonable to work with, that information should be conveyed to the sales and legal departments. If the customer experience is positive and capture that for potential for future sales or working together. Strategic lessons learned are those that typically affect some aspect of the organization's project management methodology or significantly improve a template form or a process. Uh, they address the question, can we reuse this project's artifact to get more done with the same resources and deliver the work center? There's tactical lessons learned. Uh, those that answer a couple questions. If you were to do this type of project again, what should you start, stop, and continue so you can execute the project flawlessly? These types of lessons learned help focus on development, um, recommendations for other managers and departments, um, develop implementation plans, and then implementing those plans. Other aspects of lessons learned should take into account scope, schedule, cost, quality, and customer satisfaction, and any corrective action taken in response to issues, which are risks that have been realized. Any questions on the type, the considerations of lessons learned? Has anyone, since we talked the last time, has anyone on the call started giving positive lessons more? Have they reached out to folks doing a great job and said, hey, you're awesome, appreciate you? Anyone doing any more of that? Mm, any less of that? I can't, I'm sorry. No, using quantum more, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Continuing on, we're looking at auto university briefing. Lessons learned register. Uh, at the beginning of a project, you'll create a lessons learned register, which is a project document used to record knowledge gain during a project so that it can be used in the current project and entered into the lessons learned repository. As the project progress says, progresses, 
you will continuously add information um, to the register and to help identify strengths and well as areas of improvement or areas of uh, strengths and weaknesses. Lessons learned register can be formal or informal depending upon your organizational norms or requirements. A lessons learned register can take many forms. Simplest register is a document that team members can add their observations in real time. Another is a notebook with tabs, digital uh, document with folders or for topics, schedule scope, cost, conflict that team members can enter observations into. One note would be a pretty cool item there. SharePoint, I guess, would be another one. Um, this provides more structure, will prompt users to enter their comments into appropriate categories, like drop downs, consistency. And even more sophisticated register is a cloud based digital document, oh, however you want now, and SharePoint, uh, with folders that is available to all team members. This is particularly useful for a project team that is located in several locations. At the conclusion of the project, a team member can audit or can edit and compile the information into a cohesive document. It can be discussed in the project closure meeting and archived for future reference and hopefully searchable. Uh, Lessons Learned Register is created for each project and then compiled into an all-encompassing Lessons Learned Repository, which is a store of historical information about lessons learned and projects. Repository will become available or become an, an OPA, an organizational process asset for current and future project teams. Uh, you capitalize on the organization's knowledge and you can improve what's been done and avoid repeating mistakes. Project responsibilities within the team. Project manager has several interpersonal skills that are used to manage knowledge. These include, this really goes back to that talent triangle, that leadership side of that, when you look at this. Leadership to communicate the organization's vision and inspire the project team to focus on the goals of the project. Facilitation to effectively guide a group uh, to a successful solution. Political awareness to keep the project manager aware of the organization's political environment and networking to facilitate relations among project stakeholders so that knowledge is shared. Does this resonate with anybody? These items, leadership, facilitation, political awareness, networking. I'm interested if any of those or maybe all of those resonate with any of you, please. And what you live every day or maybe even what you experience from, if you're a stakeholder on a project right now, how, how certain project managers maybe have, have implemented these things better than others or worse than others. I, I don't know. Let's chat about this for a second. Leadership, facilitation, political awareness, and networking. Interpersonal skills of a project manager. Steve, this went back to what you talked about earlier with those soft skills. I think it plays in here. I, I agree with that. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, one of those things you just have to be careful or you could step on a landmine, <laughs> in my experience. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Hey, William. Yeah, um, I, I would say these are really relevant um, in my in my project management. Um, role at least. So I represent PMO from a construction and engineering perspective. So the most of the projects that we work on, they're at a national level and we don't have, we don't have management holds over our stakeholders, right? So I know there's a type of project, there's a word for that type of project management. So most of our, most of our leverage comes from kind of the leadership and trust that we build with our stakeholders, right? Like we don't have actual, like we're not their bosses, right? So we don't have that leverage over them to get things done. So I think just having that political awareness and that strong networking skills and just being relatable with them is is really key um, to not just project, not just every PM, but for me 
specifically even like I see it every single day in my role. So mm -hmm. that's a great contribution, Victoria. Thank you. And it's so true. You can see the pin box shift. And as everybody, as you guys get, get, get moving and get through this and get through your exam, and you kind of think about this from a different lens now, like, how do I apply this? And what does this mean? And, I, you know, you're looking at it from a different lens, less than a, I need to pass an exam lens, which, by the way, is important. But you start looking at the pin box, and especially now, because it's so much reduced, they're giving us concepts. And leadership is a huge, huge skill of a project manager. It's not just managing budget and schedule anymore on a Gantt chart. It's not. You will not succeed if you don't at least acknowledge the interpersonal skills that are required and all the other leadership stuff. And now they want to, you know, the business and strategic expertise that we need to have, right? Any more contributions to this, please? I think this is the fun stuff about project management that, I don't know, when it shifted, you know, uh, 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 but it, it, the the role of a PM, it's so exciting. It's so much more than it used to be. It's it's just, it, it really is. It really is great. Anyone want to speak to all of these or anyone want to speak to a couple of these as it relates to uh, to where you're at every day? I'll, I'll share something. I, I'm currently working on a, on a process. I'm in a t working with a team of peers, and every person on the team has a strong personality, and they really feel strongly about what they know. And sometimes, uh, you know, the phrase that always comes to mind in situations like this is uh, either lead, follow, or get out of the way, or, or at least know which which track to take in any given situation. There's times where, you know, if you see, you know, the team that you're working with, with is lacking leadership and you recognize that, then you should step up to the plate. And, you know, not to say that you'll maintain that, but at least to get it, keep it moving. And And also, you know, in terms of, you know, being able to, to spell out the the vision of the project and the goal is really key in in getting people to rally around you know what the end goal is you know if you don't articulate that in a way that they can relate to it then it's really hard to get them on board 100 percent to give everything they have so i i think those those are kind of key there we oh, good stuff larry <laughs> That's really great stuff. I was reading something in preparation for today where they said one of the key successors of working through change, think of it as a project manager, as a, as a leader, as a project leader, which is what we are, right? It's having everyone align with a shared goal. And just what you just said, Larry, it's so perfect. Like if everyone knows where they're going, Everything that we're supposed to do along the way aligns to that. It's a hub from that, and or it's a spoke from that hub. And it, it, it uh, you don't know. I, there's just there's so much to it. So you articulated it way better than I did, Larry. But really nice contribution there. Anyone else want to add any more, please? Right. I, I think the yeah. concept of the emotional intelligence goes in here too, especially with mm -hmm. the last example of like, mm -hmm. um, get out of my way or, you know, move or let me do it or this person does that. Being self-aware yeah. and also being aware of like the team and how we need to communicate with them. Some might just want to direct um communication they just want to know the a b and the c they don't need to know mm -hmm. how we got there mm -hmm. like some of those concepts were going in my head wow that's great or going around mm -hmm. yeah that's a really great contribution and i that specifically resonates with me because my 
doctoral research was on informal leadership of a project manager. You know, we have all kinds of research, all kinds of books, all kinds of stuff on leaders being leaders, you know, you know, frontline leaders to, you know, C-suite leaders. But it was an interesting part of looking at, well, what do we do as project managers all day long? We lead people that don't have to listen to us. They don't have to, right? Fact of the matter is it's, it's, it's informal leadership. I took a look at things through that kind of a lens. I applied learning agility and the skills of a project manager around that, but around the same lines uh, is emotional intelligence. How might project managers benefit from improved self-awareness and emotional intelligence to improve their projects? I think we're getting to a point now in research where we can measure that stuff and, and see how it actually affects the execution of a project by some quantifiable measure, whether it be, I don't know, it's hard to tell at 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 and T, what is a successful project? It's to me anymore. It seems that it's either done or it's not done. Um, you know, if I need more money, I will get more money. Uh, you know, if I need more time, most of the folks are like, "Oh well, we get it because there's something more important anyway." So it, it's not clear cut in my projects that I work. Um, but you know, it'd be interesting to see how all that comes together, and as the role of a project manager continues to shift and you know, maybe we'll see more development of that. It ain't going to be Gantt charts and, you know, that kind of stuff anymore. It's going to be emotional intelligence and, and learning agility and change management and all those types of things are the concepts that they're going to teach us. Because that's really where we're going to be able to add, you know, a lot of value. Really great contribution on that one. That I don't think a lot of people think about. Emotional intelligence. What else, please? Okay, All right, let's continue then. So work environment expectations. Uh, the project manager is responsible for the successful sharing and transfer of project knowledge. Early in the project, the project manager should set expectations of how this should occur. The project kickoff meeting is an excellent venue for this to take place because key members of the project team will be present, either in person or virtually. Um, typical expectations for sharing excuse me, for sharing and transferring project knowledge at the kickoff meeting include the following. Knowledge is not constant. What you knew yesterday can change based on what you did today. Uh, continuously evaluate the project environment for new risks and follow the risk management plan to proactively address them before they become issues. Right? Issues are risks that have been realized. Don't hoard knowledge. Follow the communication plan and inform stakeholders when something changes that might affect their work. Use appropriate tools to share knowledge with stakeholders. Face-to-face, -face, informal meetings and informal, telephone, email, wikis, internet, printed documents. A lot of this stuff we do, a lot of that knowledge sharing. I've gotten a lot of value out of wikis at AT&T. Um, I would actually be lost on a pro one of my projects without a wiki that we have. It's just incredible. So very thankful for that kind of a thing. Now let's transfer approach. Knowledge transfer consists of connecting individuals in person or virtually to share tacit knowledge and collaborate together. This can be accomplished by a number of techniques, including networking, facilitating special interest groups, meeting seminars and various other types of in-person and virtual events that encourage people to interact and exchange ideas and knowledge. Um, all the PMI modules that we go through, all the PDUs that we have to have, right? It's all a part of continuous learning, training that involves interaction between attendees, work shadowing and reverse shadowing provide more individualized method to exchange of specialized knowledge. So let's look at the guidelines to maintain team and knowledge transfer. If your project has a project management office, follow its guidelines on documenting new knowledge. Be alert to new sources of project knowledge and follow the communication management plan to convey that knowledge to stakeholders. Proactively seek new knowledge. Compile a lessons learned register throughout the project's lifecycle. Add it to lessons learned repository 
with registers from other projects. Oh, there. So learning goals. I think this repeats from our learning goals today. We covered these last three: managing project changes, changes, attacking issues with the optimal action to achieve project success, and then confirm the approach for the knowledge transfers. Guess what? Hey, let's do this. Let's do number one at least. Give me. Give me 10 minutes of engagement, right? I mean, we'll end early, but I don't wanna to end too early, right? I respect your time, but let's, let's have some engagement. So here's the question on the tape that I wanna put on the table. What aspects of executing the project plan have you found to be the most challenging? But let's focus this on today's topics of change control, lessons learned, um, what else was it? issues, Based on what we talked about today, what aspects of executing a project have you found to be the most challenging? Let me let me start the fire. Right, we we talked about some really cool topics like risks, and then issues, and then when risks become issues, we talked about the leadership. You know, some of the, the, the tacit knowledge, the um, soft skills of a project manager. I don't care how you answer the question, whether it's from a stakeholder perspective, your experience with a great project manager, right? Your experience with a new project manager, maybe, maybe your experience as a project manager. What have you found to be the most challenging? Hey, Will, I, I'd like to comment. Yes. Um, so uh, I guess I was going back to something that you asked us to cover on a few um, minutes ago concerning the uh, positive lessons learned. And so I would say for a lot of people, uh, some of the uh, most challenging part of the project plan would be really assessing and acknowledging those who are, are, are giving some positive lessons. Um, I, and I wasn't... <laughs> wasn't able to provide my input then, but I'd like to now. Uh, and I'd like to, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, on our project, we work with Patrick Gallagher has done a great job uh, leading our uh, uh, reporting. And he is, you know, acknowledged on that pretty, pretty frequently. So, uh, yeah, I, I've seen on a, a couple of other, other projects that people aren't willing to necessarily uh, applaud each other and then when they're doing mm -hmm. a good job. So mm -hmm. what what techniques are used, Antonio? I mean, is it is it a phone call saying, hey, dude, you're just killing it? Is it a cue? Is it something more formal like a high five or an email recognition to the I mean, what 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 have you experienced? I, I've experienced all the high five is formal. I mean, you know, whether it's a queue, a phone call, and even even in some of our daily planning uh, meetings that we have, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I'd like I'd like to hear more of those, and I think it is effective, and I think it does make make the that person in that group, you know, say, hey, you know, I am doing a good job. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm That's great. Thanks, Antonio. I appreciate that. I 100% agree with you. What else do we have, please? I think one of the things that, that I've experienced is that, uh, you know, when you when you do uh, run into issues in a project and you try to resolve them, you know, sometimes the best qualified person to answer the questions or have or lead you to the answer is not willing to share. Where they wow. they stay silent, and uh, you know it's like pulling teeth sometimes. Uh, negotiate, <clears throat> you know, participation. 
from everybody that uh, you know because typically when you're in a team you you have a sense as to people's skill level and knowledge um, mm -hmm. and you know it can be pretty challenging to navigate through an issue issue resolution when you know that uh, just some folks aren't contributing to their optimum. But Larry, have you found that to be an issue that's realized? Like what about when we hear about surplus announcements or we, heard, we hear about restructuring um, an organization? I mean, do you, do you think that those types of things happen more because folks don't, they don't want to share what they know because they may be the only one that knows it. And that's job security, right? What are your thoughts? Exactly. No, no, that's, that's true. It's uh, information is power to coin the phrase, you know, rather to uh, borrow a phrase. Uh, the, um, I think that uh, folks need to be encouraged and understand that there's, you know, other types of rewards and, and benefits of sharing what you know. You know, but mm -hmm. it's it's kind of difficult. People, you know, they 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 have different, you know, values, principles, and you know, you have to negotiate that. You know, try to keep everybody in the, you know, looking at a, and operating in a higher plane, so that yeah. people don't feel intimidated. But but you know, getting back to the surplusing, you know, I I think that a lot of that um, is can can actually have an adverse effect on people who do know, you know, mm -hmm. know what they're doing and want right. to keep it right. that way. Mm -hmm. Another reason people don't speak up is they've been told when you do speak up, you're volunteering. Oh, so we, that's a good one. Good point. Good point. Yeah, that's, that is a good point. That is a great point. I hadn't even considered that. Yeah, then you get voluntold, right? <laughs> yep. nobody, yeah. If nobody volunteers. Exactly. It happens to me all the time. Yeah. Wow, that was great. Yeah, good. Good. But I can never keep my big mouth shut. Yeah. Well. What other contribution, please? Aspects of executing the project that have you found to be the most challenging? I think another is when you are trying to get those lessons learned in the end, nobody really wants to talk about the things that could be better. They only want to talk about the good things in the end. They don't want to talk about what went not so great because uh, mm -hmm. they don't want to bring that to the, the forefront when mm -hmm. really you can learn so much from those things um, and, and going forward can make such a contribution with those things. It, it's just mm -hmm. hard to get people to admit it, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you have an experience where you're able to overcome that, Jennifer? No. Or techniques? <laughs> okay. It's been so long, no, I really haven't. I think it, you know, it seems so, sometimes it seems so, I don't know, it almost feels weird. Like sitting here, like, here we go, here's a team building event, and, you know, all that stuff, carrot and stick days is what that was, you know, like, oh, my gosh, how do we keep our team motivated? Well, here's a carrot, we'll, you know, we'll do this stuff. It, it seems, I don't know, it, it's, you know, like like one of, the, one of you all mentioned about, you know, sharing a common goal. And I, so now the goal is to share lessons that way we don't go through the same stuff. And maybe it's so that way we can share some of the things. We've got some other related projects that are going to benefit from the good stuff we did. Oh, well, that's going to save me work. It's like, what's in it for me kind of stuff where you get the most participation. So, so how do you, how do we as project managers just say there's a benefit to you 
sharing this knowledge. And here's what it is. You know, I don't know. Hey, this is Alan. Any? I have one that I'll just add right fast. Um, one that I'm experiencing right now is more kind of related to change, uh, change control more so specifically when it comes to roles and, re roles and responsibilities. Um, so I have a project currently that I'm managing where uh, we have some individuals who, who actually are going to be retiring, um, and I'm having to deal with some changes in you know, who's going to be coming in to replace those individuals. And then um, first identifying who's going to be coming in to replace those individuals, um, that's actually out of my, my control, of course. Um, and then making sure that uh, uh, those responsibilities are being, um, are being uh, transferred over correctly and timely. So that, that's mm -hmm. one of the things I've been dealing with. How are you dealing with that, Alan? What do you, what's your what's your thought process on that? Um, so what I've been doing is I've just been uh, keeping track of what they're telling me. Um, you know, at least that person's leadership for one person that's retiring. I, I've been staying in contact with that individual's uh, supervisor who's supposed to be back filling that role. Um, that way, at least I can have an idea of you know what the timeline should be of when the replacement should come in. Um, and then if I know that's going to fall behind, I can start <laughs> game planning or coming up with some kind of, uh, uh, yeah, some sort of game plan to, to work around that. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way, whether you call it this or not, you're working a risk register and tracking right. what could happen if this person isn't backfilled, either that or he isn't backfilled soon enough, and you'll hopefully have a plan that, if it, when it becomes an issue and he does leave, then here we go. We need to have it by, yeah, that's a, so you're, you're applying actually most of what we talked about today. So good stuff. Very cool. And do you Thank all you, find that it. with the, the new retirement um, possibility of a lot of mass exodus at mm -hmm. the end of this year is, yep. is becoming a big toll on everybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should all have that in our risk register or yeah. all that knowledge. The knowledge that will be lost or Oof. left. We're talking decades of knowledge with some, I mean, some of these yeah. people, I can't imagine. It's been at at and so long, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow, that is a lot of knowledge. Holy smokes. Yeah. All right, so anything else that anyone wanted to contribute, please? I really appreciate your engagement. It, it makes this so much more enjoyable for all of us when we're able to just kind of talk. Have to have a conversation about this stuff and not just listen to what Will's saying and multitask. This is important stuff. And again, it's it's the concept, right? It's, it's understanding the concepts. It's understanding what the PMBOK tells us to do. Remember, after you get done with the test, then you can say, well, AT&T doesn't do that. So how do I adjust to that? If, if PMBOK tells you to do something, you're going to do it for the test. Don't forget that stuff. You know, what, what do you call it? Risk register. Well, we may not call it at AT&T. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's a risk register. It's an issues log. It's a workaround if it's an issue. It's a, it's a risk uh, response. If it, you know, those types of things, just, I just encourage everyone to get the concepts. We talked about really great stuff today. Just makes it more exciting. Any final comments? Let's give it four more minutes and then we'll go. Any final comments for the day? Any aha moments? Any, um, you know? Uh, someone put anything in the else chat. Anything else from anybody, please? If we mm -hmm. could go over political awareness again. Um, sure. And I think, I think uh, a good way to go over it would be just from a different perspective. Um, when I look at it uh, from an at t perspective, I think that's that's something that's uh, rather easy to comprehend. But with external customers, it, it kind of goes above my head when they say, like, oh, we're going to get this person involved, X, Y, Z. And in my mind, it's like, well, they're not intimately involved with the project, so there's no... <laughs> <laughs> like my political awareness goes out the window at that point, even though they they're building a, rep a repertoire. So I think read uh, 
going more in depth on that would help answer that question. Sure. So, so political awareness, I mean, whenever I think about how I apply politics, right, in my projects, you look at things like the prioritization of work, you look at, you put things together, right, where, where's it all going to bottleneck, right, it'll bottleneck at shared resources, generally all of everything that we do, well, it'll bottleneck it, it, it can bottleneck with money too, but assuming that there's money there, we're gonna all we're gonna have shared resource, and this is my experience with politicking. It's my I have my shared resources. So, you know, think about it. I, everyone is competing for these folks. Every every project, every project manager's project is more important than any other project manager's project. We all think that way. We're all type A. That's how we. That's just how we are. So, my politicking would be understanding the prioritization of work and the why of what is going on around me. And that helps me drive to some of the decisions and some of the risks that I'm going to see with my work. There's times when I step back, right? And, and, and I think it's just those overarching shared components of every project. And then again, it comes down to the, to the shared resources. You know, again, my example is, I, you know, the project that I'm running, it was, I don't know, it's not the highest priority project, but it's certainly not the lowest. I just want to get it, I, I want it done. It needs to be done. There are certain drivers to get it done, and it's more of a program. Any program is 12 projects together. But I have these shared resources that I'm competing with for what other projects. But what I was able to do was you find, manipulation is not the right word here. You find the right strategy to help them understand the benefit that they get from completing this as well, right? That's where the politicking comes in, in, in my mind. More so with the overarching, the awareness of everything that's going on in the world of AT&T, by the way, not the world, but AT&T's world. And developing a strategy and a, and a campaign, if you will, but more of a strategy to say, here's what we get from completing my stuff as well. And here's how I can help you help me. That's, that's my take on it, but I am never going to claim to be an expert on it. And I'm happy to have another contribution. Compliment or challenge the way that I'm thinking about political awareness within an organization. And sometimes it is who you know, by the way. I think someone should say that. If you know someone and they know your project and they know what's going on, you can say, look, but if we can just, we're, we're talking about X amount of this or little of that or whatever, whatever. And it could be like one of those, like, you know, because of your networking abilities, like, okay, I got you. We're going to take care of this. You know, not a problem. And that's happened for me. Go talk to the right people. It's not an escalation all the time, by the way. It's just in, sometimes you inform. And they can say, all right, well, I'll help you out with this. What else can anyone add? I don't know if I added any value to what you're asking. I hope I did. At least a perspective. Maybe not the answer. I think political awareness is uh, having an understanding of what's acceptable within an organization. So, you know, some things that may be acceptable in one organization may not be acceptable in another, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, maybe a certain level of change may be acceptable in one company, but not in another. And I guess it's mm -hmm. understanding, you know, what is okay. deemed acceptable within an organization in terms of, you know, change or uh, certain activities. I would certainly agree with that as well. What else? Anyone want to add to political awareness, please? My lens was more from strategic, and then Enda uh, had mentioned it from a cultural perspective as well. So there's maybe there's different lenses where it applies. It'd be interesting to maybe dig in a little bit deeper. End of the day, we're trying to get stuff done. That's what all these are about. You know, it's a leadership facilitation, political awareness, networking. It's what do you need to do? It's those informal or 
interpersonal skills to get stuff done. I think political awareness could be, hey, remember that last time I helped you out? Can you hooked me up this time? Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. I think that's part of it, too. It's just, and networking. I think, yeah, those two, those two are at least cousins, political awareness and networking. Oh, then there's people that suffer as well because of that. Yeah, you can't do it all the time. That's why I think it's strategic. You do it at the right time. You ask, if you're escalating everything, then nothing's an escalation anymore because will escalates everything. No, a will comes here for an escalation. There's something up. Um, oh, let's, let's talk about this. He never does this. You know? What else we got? Anything else about today, please? I'm happy to let you guys go, so don't. But if you do have something to say about the content of today, today's presentation, please, please chime in. I want to give you that opportunity. Someone else may, may get something from what you have to say. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to end recording right now.